Happy birthday to me. I like to drink whiskey with my good buddy Chompy. And it's also my birthday. Hooray. Hooray. Hooray! Nice. Kobe! Nailed it! Nailed it. I definitely did not just make a colossal mess all over the kitchen counter. Just absolutely nailed it. Perfect. Good morning, metalheads of the internet, and welcome to a brand new, very special episode of The Metal Meltdown, which is being uploaded today on my actual for realsies birthday, November 22nd. And I figured since last year on my previous birthday, I told you all about my all-time favorite metal bands, I would tell you all about my all-time least favorite metal bands. The bands that I hate more than any other. The bands that I think are the worst of the worst. Fun fact, my lovely wife Anna celebrates her birthday the following day, November 23rd. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that wild? And also, heads up, we have decided we will celebrate together here on the Metal Meltdown this coming Friday, November 24th at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time with a very special Super Mario Brothers Wonder drinking game. Some of y'all should already know the drill when it comes to these Metal Meltdown parties and live streams. We drink, we shoot the shit, we play video games, we get up to all kinds of stupid, goofy stuff because this particular party and live stream is also a double birthday bash. Anne and I will be busting out more expensive vodka, specialty whiskeys. It's gonna be big, dumb, loud, and stupid as hell, and I cannot wait. And I cannot wait for you specifically to be there because as per the norm, it's just not a party without you. So please do be there, if only just for a moment to say hello and have a shot with us. This coming Friday, November 24th, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And just a little disclaimer before we go any further, if you happen to like one or two or three or several or even all of the bands included in this video, talked about in this video, good. I'm happy for you please continue to do so. By all means, love those bands, and by all means, defend them in the comments. Just be aware that me not liking a band is not an attack on you, and there's no need to get, like, really worked up and really angry and really pissy. All right, first up, an obvious choice for this list, and probably the one I'm still gonna get the most pushback on because... For some reason, they're really popular right now. I don't get it. I guess I never will at this point. Limp Bizkit, American new metal rap metal crew responsible for iconic records like $3 Bill Y'all, Significant Other, and Chocolate Starfish and the Hot Dog Flavored Water. I hate everything Limp Bizkit does with a burning passion. I think that... Some of the people in Limp Bizkit are genuinely talented. Wes Borland in particular has made stuff with projects like Blacklight Burns and Big Dumb Face that I think is really interesting. But respectfully, I see Limp Bizkit as a reflection, a, a caricature, if you will, of everything that was wrong and terrible and fucking stupid about uh, late 90s, early 2000s, new metal and rap metal and alternative metal and mainstream metal culture. I think Limp Bizkit just consistently makes some of the most annoying, obnoxious, cringeworthy fucking shit imaginable. Fred Durst in particular, probably one of the worst metal lyricists out there. I hate the way he raps. I hate the way he sings. I think he has this really like nasally whiny fucking voice that as far as I'm concerned it's it's about on the same level as nails on a chalkboard. To be frank I was extremely happy throughout the 2010s when the general consensus was that Limp Bizkit was done. I mean they did a few shows here and there. They released a few standalone singles one of which was an awful collaboration with Lil Wayne. Of course Limp Bizkit would finally eventually release an album in 2021 called Still Sucks 
and in my opinion, it's just as bad as everything else Limp Bizkit have done beforehand, except this time it's, quote, self-aware and has a really clever sense of humor. I would argue it doesn't, but there are a lot of Limp Bizkit fans that would argue otherwise. So, good for them, I guess. And now Limp Bizkit are, like, really popular again, and I think there are ultimately two reasons for that. I think a part of it is nostalgia. Limp Bizkit was a big band in the late 90s and early 2000s, and, you know, nostalgia sells always, period. But also, I think that, like... Limp Bizkit became such a fucking meme band, and people spent so much time ironically posting, like, Limp Bizkit songs and memes on Discord and Reddit, and, you know, uh, making jokes about Limp Bizkit, and telling stupid stories about Limp Bizkit, that they kind of, like, brainwashed themselves into liking Limp Bizkit. Next up, Five Finger Death Punch. Much like Limp Bizkit, I think they are an excessively obnoxious, annoying, a uh, cringeworthy band to an almost overwhelming level. Everything Five Finger Death Punch makes sounds like it was made for, like, white trash dudes in their late 20s to early 30s and mid 30s who just want to drink, like, Monster Energy Drink and White Claw and the shittiest, most corporate fucking beer ever. Their music sounds like a combination of, like, Pantera, Nickelback, Toxic Masculinity, and just pure white trash bullshit. It's constantly trying so hard to project this image of being really tough, really hard, to the point where it just looks kind of ridiculous and laughable. Especially when Five Finger Death Punch puts out like a more tender, introspective, moving ballad, which is often just overblown to hell with some of the vocal dynamics and the drums, like it ends up just sounding like a huge overdramatic mess. The music itself is so simple, so generic, some of the most one-dimensional, predictable riffs and choruses and grooves ever. It's essentially butt rock, but like, way heavier and deep fried, and it reeks of like, lukewarm beer. I've told this story a few times over the years, but I'll tell it again. I remember going to see Five Finger Death Punch at the Rockstar Energy Drink Mayhem Festival in 2013, and there was one guy that was there all fucking day who had no reaction to any fucking band. He stood there with his arms fucking crossed, looking like a, a big, sad, sour stick in the mud. And the moment Five Finger Death Punch hit the stage, he lost his goddamn mind. He started drinking like a fiend. He tore off his shirt. He was screaming and hooting and hollering. I'm pretty sure I saw him punch a guy at one point. Also, during that same show, they brought out, like, two kids. I don't know who these kids were. And they just instructed these kids to flip the middle finger to everyone in the crowd. And I just thought that that was, like, really fucking lame. Everyone was like, oh, look at those badass fucking kids. Hell yeah. And I just thought, like, what fucking dumbass let their kids go up on stage with five finger goddamn dev punch? What dumbass brought their kids to this fucking giant touring metal festival with like Children of Bodom and Machine Head and a Monomarf and Job for a Cowboy. Who, whose fucking brilliant idea was that? Next up is Falling in Reverse. And before somebody says it, no, Falling in Reverse is not on this list because Ronnie Radke is an objectively horrible human being. They are not on this list because I have personally beefed with Ronnie Radke on a number of occasions. Falling in Reverse are on this list because Falling in Reverse are a terrible fucking band that makes terrible fucking music. Even at their very best, Falling in Reverse are a thoroughly mediocre, barely average, metalcore, post-hardcore crew. Ronnie Radke's like regular vocal tone and delivery, so whiny, so nasally. It almost sounds like a parody of like really crappy pop punk post-hardcore vocals. And then Falling in Reverse at their worst, are responsible, I would say, for some of the worst songs ever. You've got Alone, which is a weird mishmash of like electronic core and rap metal. It's got one of the worst choruses in the fucking world. Some of the worst lyrics I've ever seen in any kind of rock song. 
In a lot of the verses, he's bragging about how cool he is, how badass he is. Everyone who hates him is just, you know, they're a loser. They wash dishes for a living. What do they know about anything? And then in the chorus, all of a sudden, he's whining about never wanting to be alone. Then there's the infamous game over. My life is like a video game. I mean, this song has been memed to fucking hell for good goddamn reason, frankly. Like the video game sound effects, Ronnie's like super nasally tone, like, My life is like a video game trying hard to beat the stage. Like it's so goofy, it's so exaggerated. If I didn't know anything else about Falling in Reverse and I just heard this song, I'd be like, I'm done. I don't need to hear nothing else. I see no reason to take this band seriously. Who could forget classics like The Drug in Me Is You, I'm Not a Vampire, and Good Girls Bad Guys either, like... So edgy, so cringe, so funny. Falling in Reverse have not had an album since the ridiculously underwhelming Coming Home in 2017, but they've remained extremely busy putting out quite a few standalone singles, many of which have actually been big hits. They're a little bit more complex as well sound-wise, blending a variety of different topics and genres. The end result has been mostly the same, though. If anything, it has shown that Ronnie Ragge really doesn't know what he's doing, and he's really bad at meshing genres together. Watch the World Burn in particular, its combination of modern hip-hop in the vein of Tom McDonald with, like, explosive melodic metalcore and post-hardcore. Wow. Just fucking awful. Some of his all-time worst lyricism as well, alongside Zombified, that chorus in particular with Ronnie screaming out, They're canceling, canceling you! Like, God fucking damn it, dude. Falling in reverse, crying about cancel culture will never not be funny, too, because if there's anyone who single-handedly proves that cancel culture isn't real, or at the very least not that big of a deal, it's Ronnie goddamn fucking Radkey. Next up, we have Otep, an underdog of the 2000s new metal, alternative metal scene. Of all the bands we're talking about today, this is the one that I genuinely wish I did like. I want to like this band. I like that Otep is headed up by Otep Shamaya, who herself is an openly queer, politically active woman. That's great to see in metal. I like the ideas that she advocates for and that she preaches in her music. I just think that the delivery is consistently really bad. Everything that she's working to get is diluted by really bad lyricism, by erratic, nonsensical genre fusion stuff. I think as time has gone on too, her music and her lyrics have gotten less and less nuance, less and less balance, there's less insight, there's less uh, actual like intelligence and insight. We're not really exploring any real issues anymore. We're just kind of shouting and yelling. It's basically Twitter lib politics. The album Cult 45 in particular occupies a territory very similar to that of Americant from Ministry, where it's just extremely repetitive, and it's basically just like Orange Man Bad over and over and over again. Like, Otep went from tackling really important political, societal, economic issues to just going Orange Man Bad over and over and over again. And it really doesn't matter where you stand on the political spectrum, what you think of Orange Man or not, whether or not he is bad or not, uh, any message delivered that forcefully, that stubbornly, is going to fail. It's going to make you look annoying, it's going to make you look preachy and obnoxious. Her most recent album, The God Slayer in particular, is an absolute fucking mess. I don't know who convinced her that covering a wide variety of songs from Nirvana, Slipknot, The Beach Boys, uh, Little Peep, Olivia Rodrigo, Billie Eilish, and many more was a good idea. I don't know who supported her in butchering all of these songs and making them sound like the most fucking pretentious, overproduced, like, industrial alternative new metal possible. Whoever did do that, though, I hate you and I wish nothing but the worst for you. Hands down, one of the worst fucking records of the year. Not even fucking close. It might be near the very tippy top, honestly. Next up, we have Six Feet Under. This should not be a shocker. I've talked a lot about Six Feet Under and how much I fucking hate so much of what they've done. 
Yes, I'm aware that Chris Barnes was the former lead singer for Cannibal Corpse. Yes, I'm aware that he performed on iconic records like Butchered at Birth and Tomb of the Mutilated and The Bleeding. Yes, I'm aware he's an incredibly influential lyricist and vocalist. The death metal scene would be uh, drastically different without him. But also, that was 30 years ago! Stop kissing his ass just because he used to be great. In the entire time that I have been alive, he has been a member of Six Feet Under, not Cannibal Corpse. In the entire time that I've been alive, he has been responsible for some of the most mid, some of the most generic, some of the most lifeless and stupid and downright horrible death metal out there. I do not care that he was great 30 years ago, because that was 30 fucking years ago. I literally wasn't even alive. The Graveyard Classics albums in particular, as well as the last full-blown studio albums like Torment, Nightmares of the Decomposed, holy fucking shit. The worst riffs, the worst production, the worst lyrics, and the worst vocals too. Barnes's voice has degraded continuously over the years to the point where he is now literally a joke. Like, we make fun of Chris Barnes all the fucking time here on this channel. We make fun of Chris Barnes all the fucking time on social media and on the Metal Meltdown Discord. During live streams, I will literally have people tuning in telling me, Hey, can you do the fucking Chris Barnes impression that you did in the Nightmares of the Decomposed album review? That'd be really cool and great of you. They love hearing it. Why? Because we all know that he's a fucking joke and we love making fun of him. The only person that doesn't appear to be in on the joke is Chris Barnes himself. I used to joke that I could probably do my Chris Barnes impression and just play some random riffs and it would be better than any Six Feet Under record. Now I don't think it's a joke. It really does not take much to be better than Chris Barnes. Oh, but the first, the first couple of albums were good. They were really good. They were really good. Really? Were they? Or were they just diet obituary? And were you just like so hyped up on Chris Barnes' worship juice that you couldn't recognize it as diet obituary? Next up, we have Design the Skyline. They were an experimental, avant-garde, deathcore, metalcore band operating in the early to mid-2010s. I remember when I first heard the song Surrounded by Silence and saw its accompanying music video. I remember I was still in high school and it ended up going viral and was very quickly regarded as quite possibly one of the worst metal songs ever made. Like almost immediately once everyone heard it, there was a genuine consensus that it was the worst of the worst, and all these years later, I absolutely agree with that statement. This fucking song sounds like the spastic, mutant freak child of the Dillinger escape plan, I wrestled a bear once, escape the fate. It is an absolute fucking clusterfuck in every single way. It feels random, it's erratic. The synthesizers, the clean vocals, those awful fucking guitars, you know, it's it's so janky and it's just a bunch of like weird scales and riffs and licks contrasted with like the most generic like metalcore, deathcore breakdowns. To my knowledge, this band only ever released like two albums. There's the Galactical Celebration demo released under a different name, Extra Large Kids which was really fucking bad. It was basically like the worst elements of Blood on the Dance Floor and that whole kind of like late 2000s crunk core, electronic core scene mixed with some weirder elements. And then there's 2011's Neve or Neva. I'm not really sure exactly how it's supposed to be pronounced. It's their only full-blown studio album and it's objectively pretty fucking awful. It's just kind of a big, weird, jumbled thing. All these vocals that don't really fit, all of these guitars that don't really fit, weirder experimental tones and textures and synthesizers and electronic bits and pieces. It's ugly, it's garish, it's crude. Between 2011 to 2018, Design the Skyline did continue to release a few standalone singles here and there. Um, and to be fair, they were, like, better by comparison, but still overall very generic, like, melodic metalcore. 
nothing to write home about. The kind of stuff that, like, you probably would have put together, like, in your middle school, high school, metalcore band that you put together with your classmates. After, like, listening to fucking Kill Switch Engage or asking Alexandria for the first time, you know, some shit like that. Next up, we have some serious hardcore metal meltdown alumni. I don't think there's a single content creator who has talked about this band as much as I have, let alone more than I have. Of course, I'm referring to the one, the only, the now legendary, I suppose, Psycho Sinner, aka Psychosexual, a.k.a. the brainchild of Jeremy Spencer, former drummer for Five Finger Death Punch. Which means congratulations are in order, Jeremy. You're one of the only people to be included on this list twice. I'm so proud of you. For those of you who somehow don't know, first off, I'm so happy for you. Second, this is a project that went through a bunch of different kind of phases and iterations and, and versions. It started off as a raunchy pop project that was just called Devil Daddy. Jeremy would dress up in a weird red latex devil suit and he would perform all these very crude, not safe for work kind of like underground pop songs. Then eventually Devil Daddy was made to be the singer of a metal band called Psychosexual. They released one album in 2020, which drew the attention of the entire metalverse. I talked about it. Quest for Metal talked about it. Even Anthony Fantano talked about it. The album was so unpopular because of its gross lyrics, its generic music, its weird, creepy, cringy vibes and tones, uh, the ridiculous, like, aesthetic of Psychosexual. Like, we just dogged that fucking thing. We went to town on that fucking thing. And it got so bad that Jeremy decided to remove Torch the Faith from all streaming platforms. He decided to rebrand Psychosexual as Psycho Sinner and asked all of us to give him a second chance and told us that he was going to release a new album and it was going to be better than Swords of the Faith. And I guess we, we unfortunately decided we just had to let him cook. Psycho Center did not release one album. They ended up releasing 11 albums over the course of like barely over a year and a half. And they were all equally terrible for the same fucking reasons that Torch the Faith was terrible. Psycho Sinner never, like, officially disbanded, but eventually all of Psycho Sinner's music was removed again from social media, and uh, Jeremy did an interview with Blabbermouth.net in which he talked about how uh, Psycho Sinner was no longer the focus and he was going to be focusing on a new band called Semi-Rotted, and that was basically the sign that Psycho Sinner was fucking gone. We put out a video at the time called Rest in Peace Psycho Sinner, the worst metal band of all time. A lot of people argued with me about whether or not they were the worst metal band of all time, and by all means continue to do so. But I think I stand by that claim, even ever, even after having done this list, even after having re-listened to all this stuff from OTEP and Design the Skyline and all the other bands we're about to talk about. Jeremy Spencer was just completely fucking clueless and just made horrible fucking music with Psycho Sinner and Psychosexual and uh yeah nothing nothing that they did will be missed. Next up we have the Three Tremors, a heavy metal supergroup uh that in some capacity has been talked about for a long time in the early to mid 2000s there were rumors of a project called The Three Tremors that at the time would have featured Ronnie James Dio Rob Halford and Bruce Dickinson of Dio, Judas Priest, and Iron Maiden fame, respectively. That version of Three Tremors, though, is not the version we are talking about, though. Uh, that version is made up of S-tier heavy metal vocal talent. This version is C, C-minus talent at best. Instead, we got Tim Owens, a man who has worked with everyone from Iced Earth to Yngwie Malmsteen to the aforementioned Judas Priest during a period where Rob Halford left the band. Uh, we have also Sean Peck, who's in a band called uh, Cage, who I, to this day, have never heard a single song from, as well as Harry Conklin from Clovenhoof and Jag Panzer. Um, so, yeah, definitely a big step down from Dio, Rob Halford, and Bruce Dickinson. These guys just ended up playing, like, really, really generic, meat and potatoes, old-school heavy metal, 
while the three singers just wailed and roared over top of each other as if they were fighting for the microphone. The result is something that is annoying and it feels very show-off-y. Again, it feels like they're fighting for attention. They're fighting for the spotlight. There's no balance whatsoever. A lot of their voices are very similar too. Like there's nothing really unique about these three voices and they very often just kind of blend together. It really just sounds like three grown men doing the worst impressions of Rob Halford and Judas Priest and and... Bruce Dickinson and Iron Maiden simultaneously. These guys only ever put out two albums, a self-titled album in 2019 and Guardians of the Void in 2021. I actually don't know much about that particular album though, Guardians of the Void, because as far as I can tell, it's not really available online anywhere. It's not on Spotify and I can't even really find uh, a lot of the songs on YouTube. What I have heard from this album though is really just as bad as everything from the self-titled album, so. Yeah, I, I still feel pretty comfortable including them on this list. Next up, we have Tougher Than Nails. I've never talked much about this band on the Metal Meltdown, but if you know who Tougher Than Nails are, then you already know why they're on this fucking list. They only ever released one album, Arise Warrior, in 2020, which I didn't hear about at the time. Had I heard about it at that time, it would have absolutely been considered like one of the worst albums of that year. And I think it is very fair to say that if nothing from the, from the aforementioned Six Feet Under can be considered the worst death metal of all time, surely this can, because this is somehow worse. This one album, Arise Warrior, is some of the most poorly performed, poorly written, poorly produced, deaf or extreme metal you'll ever hear in your fucking life. It's repetitive, it's loud, it's ugly. There's no balance whatsoever. There's a lot of feedback, a lot of static. Everything is overblown. Uh, programmed drums, and honestly what feels like programmed guitars too. Like this album just has a really fake, thin feel and vibe to it. There's not a single comprehensible lyric on here, even by death metal standards. Uh, there's not a single riff or hook that is comprehensible here even by death metal standards. It really can be described as jarring, ugly, random noise. I could very literally just slam my fucking guitar while screaming directly into this microphone. I could throw in like weird samples of glass shattering and I can fuck with the bass and I can fuck with the mix and I can just make it sound like the most blown out fucking bullshit ever. Like somebody just blasting music out of their fucking beat up fucking Honda Civic driving down fucking King Street. And I could record that and play that back to back with anything from this Arise Warrior album and you would not be able to tell the fucking difference. With a lot of the bands we've talked about, there are at least some elements that could be redeemable. Like in the case of Limp Bizkit, you can point to Wes Borland's guitar work. In the case of Otep, you can point towards the unpredictable nature of maybe the music or the vibe or the atmosphere. And even in the case of Psycho Sinner, Psycho Sexual, you can point to the, the unintentional comedy factor, like the music being so fucking bad and weird and gross that it's funny. With Tougher Than Nails, there's nothing redeemable. And last but not least, we have Dungeon Wolf. Now, you might have heard of Dungeon Wolf if you've been following the Metal Meltdown the past couple of years. I first came to know them back in September of 2021 when they released a sophomore studio album entitled Metal's Back. I talked about that album in an Albums I Missed video uh, around that time. I think it was the September one specifically. And I said, if this is what's supposed to bring metal back, then fuck it. I don't want metal to be back because I felt that that album was uh, made up of some of the most lethargic, some of the most sloppy, some of the most poorly produced and performed and written heavy metal ever. I can very honestly say I have heard middle school and high school concert bands and, and rock bands perform with more integrity, more intelligence, and more clarity than the entirety of Metal's Back, or the entirety of uh, their other album, Slavery and Steel, and this year's EP, Barbed Wire Tattoo. It's just fucking bad, man, and this is one of those rare instances where this isn't up for debate. The music is objectively fucking bad. Their instruments are out of tune, the production is really raw and really thin, 
to the point where it feels kind of cheap. Dungeon Wolf to me sounds like something that like SNL would put together for a fucking skit, like a parody about washed up rockers from the late 70s or early 80s, or maybe like uh, something that the creators of South Park would whip up. Like maybe there's an episode where Randy Marsh has a midlife crisis and decides to form a rock band. That to me is what Dungeon Wolf sounds like. And the crazy thing is Dungeon Wolf genuinely believe that their music, as sloppy and as horribly made as it is, is going to be responsible for the next revolution in rock music. They talk about it on a regular basis in comments here on the Metal Meltdown. They claim to have this massive PR company working for them to promote all this music, even though, like, Every time I've gotten a promo copy from them, it's come directly from Dungeon Wolf and not from any PR company. They talk about how some of the biggest names in the entertainment industry think this is some of the best heavy metal ever, even though that's not the case. No one knows who Dungeon Wolf are. No one really cares. They talk about how Slavery or Steel is widely regarded as one of the best power metal albums ever made. Again, to my knowledge, I've never heard anyone say that. I once pointed out to them that they have like six monthly listeners on Spotify. As of this recording, they have 13. Congratulations, you doubled those numbers, I guess. Um, and Dungeon Wolf said, never trust the polls. But like, bro, there are no polls. Like, what are you talking about? It gets weirder though, because not only are these guys just totally delusional and, and just living outside of objective reality, there's a genuine possibility they're also fucking trolls. Like huge fucking trolls, and they're just taking the fucking piss. And it would explain a lot about their attitude, about the way they present themselves online. It certainly explains a lot of the content that they have on their actual YouTube video, which shows former lead singer Derek Heljum ranting and raving about ghost, satanic corporate rock, the modern black metal movement, and all the while he'll have like these very young women alongside him, like massaging his shoulders, caressing him. And every time I look at them, I think, oh my God, they're being held hostage. Like if the camera were to pan down, you'd see they're fucking shackled to something. The fact that they go to such lengths to try to antagonize and annoy me as well, I think is also proof of them just being huge fucking trolls. Like they comment on a pretty regular basis here. I'm gonna post some of their weirdest and craziest comments right now. Gotta shout out the song Heroin Overdose as well from the Barbed Wire Tattoo EP because this song was marketed as being a loving tribute to former lead singer and guitarist Derek Heljum, but instead it reads as a very disingenuous, cold, tacky, gross kind of statement from the band. It's a very upbeat, mid-tempo kind of rockin' number that feels like a glorification of drug abuse. Like, it is just so fucked up. Like, imagine if shortly after the death of Freddie Mercury, Queen had released, like, a really over-the-top, fun, big rock number called Dying of AIDS is Fun. And that's it. I don't have any honorable mentions, nothing like that. I've been sitting here for a while. I think I've talked enough shit. I'm ready to move on and actually enjoy my fucking birthday with my good buddy Chompy and uh, maybe some more Jack Daniels. We might have to run down to the LCBO. We might have to do that. I did maybe promise Anna that I'd get some Fireball too, because she likes that shit all of a sudden, so yeah. Maybe. Thank you for watching. Tell me who you think are the worst metal bands of all time, and since I didn't hold back, I don't see a reason for you to hold back either. Let it loose. Tell me what's up. Let's fucking go. Press this button to subscribe. Look, there's even more videos here. Make sure to tune in to the Super Mario Brothers Wonder Drinking Game and Anna and Robert's Birthday Bash on November 24th. And as always, you have yourself a fantastic fucking day.